Well, thank you, Paige, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. As you uh, heard, I read Kelly's blog post on fiduciary duty earlier this year, and I knew it would be a great topic for a webinar. When I see something that's news and insightful, I like to get that promoted. And so it's especially true here in 2020, when boards and managers are pulled by so many different projects and concerns and tasks, and trying to do more things than usual all the right way. Well, I'm a real believer in what author and businessman Stephen Covey said when he said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So let's focus on that main thing today, which is the board's fiduciary duty. Now you might be thinking, I didn't sign up for this. I became a board member because I was concerned about the pool furniture, or the dated appearance of the entryway signage or the front gate not working or rising assessments, or you may have become a manager because it seemed like a good steady job in real estate that you could do, a job that had a future. So just to settle your concerns, we're not going to scare you today. We wanna to help you thrive. We wanna help the associations that you lead or manage to thrive. And that happens when you're clear on what the main thing is. So in that way, all the details, all the tasks that you do as a board member or manager, all those details begin to fall into place. I got this. So as Kelly and I go through the presentation today, there may be some opportunities to get your feedback. So even though you're all muted, we can ask for hands raised to allow you to weigh in on whatever we're talking about. So let's start with that. Grab your mouse and click on the hands raised icon in your control panel that looks like the one you see on screen. Do that if you're ready for us to get started on today's presentation. And it's great, I'm seeing hands raised go up all up and down my list here of attendees. Okay, thank you all. I'm gonna click hands down and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kelly. Program's all yours. Great, thank you, Robert, and, and thank you so much for the kind words. Um, it's nice to know somebody's reading my column. <laughs> <laughs> At least one. <laughs> At least one. Uh, anyway, uh, today we wanna talk about a word that a lot of people think they understand, uh, and, and people throw this F word around a lot. No, no, I, I'm talking about the word fiduciary. Uh, that's the word that people think they understand and people will throw it at you board members and managers and uh, it is amazing how often people really don't know what the word fiduciary and fiduciary duty truly means. So that's what I want to spend a few minutes with you today talking about. And so let's start with just the definition of what is a fiduciary. Well, a fiduciary is someone that's in a position of trust someone is, that is uh, like a trustee, they are holding and controlling the property, the money uh, of somebody else. And so a trustee or a fiduciary has some very high responsibilities. They have to respect confidentiality. Uh, they have to show good faith and honesty and, 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 and show undivided loyalty and, and, and diligence. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, trustor, regarding the beneficiary, uh, the who they are representing. Well, so as we talk about the fiduciary role, first we have to understand who does the fiduciary serve in the HOA? Do you serve yourself? Are you serving your own interests as a fiduciary? Well, of course not. Then, then you wouldn't be a trustee over anything. So it's not that. What about your neighbors? Are you the fiduciary to your neighbors? No, you're not the fiduciary specifically to your neighbors. In fact, you can't be a fiduciary to the homeowners, the individual members, you can't be. And, and here's the reason why. Think about the duty of loyalty that you've already heard about and I'll talk about it again in a few minutes. If you have a duty of loyalty to each and every of your neighbors, then you are presented with a situation where you have to vote to discipline that neighbor or perhaps pursue delinquent assessments. If you have the duty of loyalty toward them, you are not permitted to vote to discipline them or to pursue a delinquency. That would violate your fiduciary duty to them. So you can't be a fiduciary of the individual members. So Kelly, who that, you that's are- just, the That's just a wonderful example. That makes it so clear. 
Yeah, it's it's a, I can't I, I I I we don't have time for a show of hands, but I'm willing to bet of the many many folks listening to this webinar right now, many of you have had people tell you, "Well, you owe me a fiduciary duty or you're violating your fiduciary duties to me." No. Your fiduciary duties cannot be owed to your neighbors. They have to be owed to the association. You as a volunteer leader, or by the way, a professional manager, serve the association and your duties as a fiduciary are owed to that entity, whether or not it's a corporation. That uh, is who you serve, the corporate entity. And, and that is a foundation that is really critical until you understand what the fiduciary duties are and who or what you owe the duties to, you can't build on that foundation and have a healthy governance uh, practice in your association. You're gonna get off the, off the rails. So let's move on and then talk about specifically what are the basic fiduciary duties that you owe to your association as a director or a manager. First is, of course, the duty of good faith. You have to operate in good faith, and we'll, we'll break that down in a few moments. The one that you also have heard about already is loyalty. You have a duty of loyalty to the association. That means you put the association first, and you do not take any actions that favor yourself. You work for the association as a whole. Third, you have to show a high degree of care you are protecting the community assets, the community money, not just the funds, but also the property, the buildings, the fences, the roofs. That's part of what you as a board member or manager are caring for, and you have to have a high degree of care in doing so. Lastly is the duty to account. Uh, you have to be able to account for any of the association money or property in your possession. And we'll get back to that in a, in a moment as well. So those are probably the most four basic fiduciary duties uh, that would apply to the HOA. What does California law say? Now I'm based in California, but I, I dare say that all the principles that we're talking about today uh, should apply broadly across all of the jurisdictions in the United States. Uh, we're talking about very general principles today. But in our state, in California, where I happen to practice, we have a Corporations Code Section 309, and it, it also is uh, the, called the Business Judgment Rule. But these are the statutory duties that you have as a volunteer leader. Uh, you've got to, sh and I've highlighted the key moving parts here, good faith in the best interests of the association, in other words, not yourself or a, a small group of yourselves, but the whole corporation, the whole entity, and then with due care, with reasonable inquiry. So that's what the statutes say. Now, let's go back to each of these responsibilities that you have, and starting with the duty of an accounting, the duty of disclosure. Now, most of your states have laws that say what uh, type of uh, records of financial information the average homeowner is entitled to receive. Um, but uh, the duty of accounting comes up in really two ways. Um, one of the ways that's difficult is that as a fiduciary to the corporation, you have to make sure that the corporate finances and that any money that you're handling be thoroughly documented. You don't get to just, just hold on to the association checkbook and write checks and not tell the manager or anybody else. The other thing that comes into play is that you'll have members that are entitled to basic financial information about the association's finances. And even those members are entitled to get that information. And by those members, you know who I'm talking about, that guy or gal who comes in your meeting month after month and criticizes all of you, criticizes the manager, says none of you know what you're doing. You know what? The saints and the sinners have the same right to basic financial information uh, in, your, in your jurisdiction about the association's money. The other issue that where this really comes up is when you have a very active board member who's large and in charge and, and sometimes says, well, I'm the only one that gets anything done. So they'll go spend money and they'll go make commitments and they feel like they don't have to answer to anybody else because, well, I'm working for the best interests of the association. Hey, you know what? You're a fiduciary. You don't get to say, nobody can ask me. So the treasurer that refuses to answer questions to the rest of the board, the president who refuses to say how he or she spent money, uh, that's not allowed. 
uh, you have to account for every dollar that you have handled as an association uh, uh, volunteer leader. And if you can't account for it, you can actually be held liable uh, for any money or property that you can't account for what happened to it. So let's move on to the next duty of good faith. Now, um, you're all volunteers. God bless you. You're putting in lots of free time for your association. And so maybe this guy on the right kind of is, is, is uh, applicable to you. But good faith is not necessarily what you think it is. Um, first of all, good faith is, of course, you're working for the best interests of the corporation. And also, you're not motivated by bad faith by retaliation or to settle scores against uh, members. Uh, remember that good faith is not what's actually in your heart. It's what other people say is in your heart, an arbitrator or jurors or a judge. How do they determine what's in your heart? Good faith versus bad faith? Well, it's on the evidence that they get. The statements that you make, the wisecracks, the sarcastic remarks, the angry email that you sent two or three years ago, those are all factors that can play into uh, the decision as to whether or not somebody else says you're actually operating in good faith. So you may actually be in good faith. You may not mean to retaliate against somebody, but if you've left a paper trail of angry or sarcastic emails to somebody who has been mean to you and doesn't like you, that can really create a problem. So uh, bluntly, uh, managers and volunteer leaders need to be very judicious about avoiding sarcastic remarks and angry remarks and certainly threats because emails don't fade. Uh, they're just as vibrant and readable today as they were 10 years ago. I remember the old days we had faxes on thermal paper and they <laughs> used to fade, right? Yep, and you used yep. to have, right, Robert? And, yep. and, and some, some of the younger folks today may not, may not yeah, the curly, the thermal fax paper. And now uh, the, these emails, they don't fade 10 years later, or let alone three. So um, good faith is, is more than just you having a pure heart. It's, it's you clearly treating everybody equally and not retaliating against anybody. So let's move on now to loyalty. And there are a couple of things under loyalty we want to talk about. And I, I hope you enjoy the cartoon here with the great white shark sitting in a lifeguard tower <laughs> and the bather uh, asking if maybe that's a conflict of interest. Yeah, I think it probably is a conflict of interest to have the shark watching the swimmers. Uh, so I want to spend a couple of moments talking about how do we address conflicts? How do we respond to the disclosure of a conflict? And how do we document the conflict was disclosed and how it was handled? So let's first start with the basic scenario. The scenario, the board is discussing a contract and Director Roberts has possibly a personal connection. Uh, Roberts, Mr. Roberts has a nephew or a family member who owns the company or works for the company who is proposing to do work for the association. So there's, there's the possible conflict of interest. So how do we deal with that? Well, let's look at what we don't want to do. Here's what gets an F on the HOA report card. Uh, the motion made by Mr. Samuels to hire Roberts Janitorial Services, second by Johnson, motion passed four to one, meaning that Mr. Roberts, the relative, also voted on that motion. No, that is unacceptable. There's no disclosure of a conflict of interest. There's no recusing uh, or abstention noted by uh, Mr. Roberts. Uh, that's not good. Uh, how about something that's minimally acceptable? Here's a different approach. Motion made to hire the janitorial company, second. After discussion, motion passes with one abstention. And we note specifically, Mr. Roberts is the abstention. Okay. The problem here is though, it, it, it does imply that Roberts participated in the discussion. So uh, it, that's why I say it's minim, minimally uh, acceptable because at least Roberts shows that he didn't participate in the vote. Uh, let's get a little bit better. Here's, here's what I would say is good, uh, more than minimal. Uh, motion made to hire uh, the janitorial company. Uh, Vice Chair Roberts announces that Roberts janitorial is owned by his cousin, Robbie Roberts, and said he would be abstaining from voting and uh, not discussing the motion. Motion passed three to one, abstention Roberts. Okay, that's pretty good, because now we have the conflict declared, documented in the minutes, and it shows that Roberts is not 
uh, voting and it, it says he would not be discussing the motion. Of course, my problem with this, folks, is that he's still sitting there at the table with his board colleagues. So that bothers me a little bit uh, because there's a little pressure in that as he's staring at his colleagues voting on his uh, cousin or his nephew's business. <laughs> so maybe we could do better. So how about, uh, how about a, a, a B plus, a uh, uh, much better approach. Motions made, we have uh, the vice chair announcing his conflict, says he's gonna abstain, and here's where he's better. Roberts leaves the board meeting at that point in the proceedings. He doesn't abstain, he's not even in the meeting for that discussion. That's great, that's really so much better. But we can do still better. How about an A? approach. Well, here's the A approach. Um, the motion's made to hire Roberts janitorial services. It's seconded. Vice Chair Roberts says, hey, could we table this item until the end of the agenda? Because he has a possible conflict of interest. And then he leaves the meeting after disclosing the conflict. And then after discussion, the motion passes three to one. So now Roberts has declared the conflict. He's not participating in the, in fact, he's not even in the meeting at the time it's discussed. That's great. But you know what? There is still one better approach, the very best of all approach, what I call the A plus platinum approach. The association has a policy that it doesn't hire uh, vendors who are related to any director. And so it never is even considered. The motion is never made. To me, that's the very best policy. You know what, folks, it's not worth hiring a family member of a board member, and in my view, not even in hiring a member of the association, because no matter how much of a discount they offer, it will never be enough. There will always be people who will say, well, isn't that convenient that uh, so-and-so got the contract uh, as a member of the association or as uh, a relative of a director or somebody like that? Um, the uh, the the uh, when I amend uh, when I write new bylaws for associations, I typically ask the board, of course, first. But I always recommend that they have a provision right in the bylaws that says the board of directors cannot hire a member of the association or a director or a family of a member uh, without a vote of the membership as a whole. In other words, the board's not going to do it. It's too hard because whatever discount. The problem is, are you going to sue that member? Are you going to sue that brother-in-law of a member? That's going to be uncomfortable. So you're less likely to hold them accountable. So that's why I say just stay completely away from conflicts and you'll, you'll be much better off at the end. Another loyalty topic I want to mention, and this is a very frequent problem for all of us that volunteer on boards or committees, uh, participate in group decision-making. See, remember, our fiduciary duty is to the association, right? It's not to my personal beliefs or my own ego or my reputation. It's to the association. So what happens when I argue like the Dickens, I'm, I'm, I'm prepped, I bring out all the evidence and arguments I can, and I just say, board, you're wrong, you're wrong, don't do this, don't do this, and the board goes ahead and votes three to two uh, against my position. Now, I think the board is absolutely wrong. I think they made a bad decision. So is it my obligation to go to nextdoor.com and Facebook and, and put flyers around and, and tell the rest of the members how the board has lost its mind? No, not only is it not your duty to do that, it's a breach of your duty of loyalty to the, to the association to do that. Because remember, the association speaks through the board. Once the board votes, the corporation has spoken, the corporation has acted. Your loyalty is to that corporation. So you say your piece, you support the association's decision, and you move forward, even though you voted against it. But you say, Kelly, I just can't do that. I just can't support the decision. It's so wrong. Then you have to quit. You have to resign your position on the board because you can't be in that rowboat and decide to row a different direction. You're going to wind up swimming like the guy in the bottom picture. That's really, really hard, folks. It means that you have to put your own ego aside. It means you have to be humble and concede that, not necessarily that they're right, but you have to jump in with the team and try to make the best out of the decision they've made. It is absolutely not your position to badmouth the rest of the board's decision. 
And I, I've had many uncomfortable situations where I've had to write demand letters to sitting directors uh, asking them or demanding that they stop uh, trying to sabotage association decisions. Or even worse yet, I've had to write censure resolutions as a board says to another director, hey, you're violating your loyalty to the corporation. You're supposed to be supporting the corporation's decision as long as you're a director. So that's really hard. Uh, it's easy for me to teach. It's hard to execute. Kelly, can I ask one in. question here to uh, clarify? Yes, I hear what you're saying. I understand it's a team. It's a focus on the association. Is this a situation where a board member could get a little peace of mind by getting their a comment in the uh, notes that um, I'll use the illustration since we're using it today. Uh, Mr. Roberts um, objected or Mr. Roberts um, vote for the record, Mr. Roberts voted against it or is that, should they just swallow and move on? Well, I suppose that a director could ask for a roll call vote under parliamentary procedure and have their no vote recorded in the minutes. Uh, normally directors don't get to make a statement for the record. This is not the congressional record of the United States. So the, the, really the main way they can note their opposition is just asking for a roll call vote. Um, other than that though, once that, once you've registered your no vote, you've got to jump in and help the rest of the board move forward in that direction that you disagreed with. Maybe a year from now, you'll be proven right and you can decide whether or not you'll give your colleagues a private, I told you so. Um, but for now, you've got to support the decision. Yeah, just majority rule and throw your weight behind the association and swallow and move on. Yeah, yeah, you're part of a team. And once the team decides on on uh, uh, on what uh, what the play is, then you carry the football field got down, it, got you know, it. Carry down, down the field. Thank you. Um, so so another basic uh, fiduciary obligation is to take care of the association's finances. And this is where there's uh, a, a, a lot of misunderstanding, again, as to what you're supposed to be loyal to as a director. Now, managers are trained on this. Managers are trained that the association's finances are what they are. You create a budget based on the association's actual anticipated expenses, and then you uh, build, build the members accordingly. But a lot of times, directors feel obligated to protect the individual members, but that feeling is often very misplaced. Because what do the members want? Well, the average rank and file member who doesn't know really the expenses that have to be paid each month, they just want their assessments low, period. <laughs> well, but the assessments are a slice of the association's actual operating cost. So um, you can't just arbitrarily say, I'm gonna keep assessments low, period. Assessments are supposed to be whatever they are, whatever the actual expenses are. So I, I find a lot of times uh, boards uh, uh, being put under a lot of pressure not to increase assessments or to keep assessments flat year after year after year. Well, what happens if you're not going to take care of the association's actual expenses? Where do you cut so that you can artificially keep the assessments lower or keep from increasing them? Well, First of all, you're not being loyal at that point to what the association needs because the association needs its bills paid, it needs its property and buildings maintained and repaired, and it needs its ordinary ordinary other bills paid, you know? Um, so right away, when we start talking about something other than the actual expenses, we're stepping away from the corporate needs and we're now trying to deal with people's individual desires, which, may not may not be in the best interest of the association. So what do we do? Well, we defer maintenance. You know, we're not gonna paint things as often. We're not gonna fix that dry rot. We're gonna let things go farther. And of course, ultimately what happens with that? Well, it becomes more expensive later. Um, when we fail to increase assessments in an orderly way as costs increase with inflation in the normal order of things, Robert, what's, what's the first thing that our boards drop off that throw over the side of the boat when they're trying to hold the line and not increase assessments. Well, you've got it there on screen. It's that failing to fund reserves. And I think this is what you spoke about earlier. When you're failing to follow, or when the boards are failing to follow their duty of loyalty to the association and they get sidetracked, they start thinking about homeowners or their own personal assessments. That's when they're going to get off track and start, like you say, 
um, deferring things that are going to just result in increased costs downstream. Yeah, you'll have it, it's short sighted this by not funding your reserves. It's actually poor financial management because you're not preparing for the association's certain financial needs. So let's talk about an example of this short sightedness. And I, I call this reserve math. But in this scenario, let's assume for the minute that the roofs over our association buildings have exactly 20 years left before they're expected to need replacement. And we know that it's going to cost exactly $1 million 20 years from now to replace that roof. Well, in rough math, then that's 50000 a year we have to set aside, right? Leaving aside interest for a moment. And we divide that further into a month. And we know that there is $4,166.67 each and every month that that roof is deteriorating. So that's what we're supposed to be setting aside as the roof deteriorates by $4,100. We're supposed to take that $4,100 and set it aside so that by the end of the 20 years, we've got the roof paid for. If you're not setting aside that $4,100 and change, the association is actually falling into a deficit each and every month as that roof deteriorates. And you can do this with any association component. You can calculate down to the hour how much that the association, the, the, the deterioration financial loss, but because it's not realized until years from now, people don't pay attention to it. And, and we have to set aside the money now or the association is gonna be insolvent. I mean, if you don't do that, isn't it just like living off credit cards? There will be a day of reckoning if you aren't prepared. If you're not funding your reserves as recommended in your reserve study, there will be a day of reckoning when you need that roof and it will be a very painful day. So this is the long-term, this is the true financial stewardship that all boards are supposed to be doing. And don't fall prey to the populist uh, uh, pressure to just artificially not pay bills, not maintain the property, and not take care of the association by putting that money in the reserve fund. I, I actually was at, I've been at meetings a number of times over the years where somebody has said uh, in the audience to the board of directors, why do we have that money just sitting in reserves? Why isn't it doing something? Well, it is doing something. It's offsetting the deterioration. Last topic I wanna to cover just for a couple minutes more is the duty of care, the duty of reasonable inquiry. And that means that for every decision you make, board members, you are seeking the appropriate qualified advice for that decision. Now, truth be told, 95% of your decisions, the expert input is gonna be your manager. Now, I hope that you boards already, each time you have a motion and, and a decision to make about repairs or vendors, or uh, I hope you're habitually turning to your manager and seeking their input on everything, because that's why you have them there. They're there to advise you, not just to carry out your instructions. They have training and they have resources in the company. Uh, so 95% of your decisions probably are gonna be backed up by the manager, and that'll be enough reasonable inquiry but it's that other 5%. There are times that you need to get advice beyond just the manager. It may be legal, it may be engineering, it may be accounting, maybe insurance, roofing, whatever specialized advice, you may have to go beyond that. And the problem with that is, as we move to the, the next slide, is that this is an unbudgeted expense because nobody expected this particular roof to have a bunch of leaks or nobody expected the retaining wall to be tilting and cracking a little bit uh, so that you weren't planning on hiring a civil engineer. So the challenge arises when you're supposed to be seeking qualified expertise. Now, let's talk about that retaining wall. You're supposed to be getting, a, the manager usually will be the person recommending this, but you want to have a, a, typically an engineer look at that wall. Now, there's almost always somebody on the board who'll say, well, I know, you know, uh, uh, Ralph, uh, he's a civil engineer, uh, civil engineer or, uh, you know, George worked in construction in college, or, or I did some construction work when I was a young married guy, um, and they'll offer to substitute for the qualified licensed engineer. Um, that's a problem because if, if they are truly licensed, 
then that volunteer who's doing that engineering opinion for you for free, they're still putting their errors and emissions liability on the line. If they, if they give you bad engineering advice and they hurt the association, the association uh, may well look to them to re, well, that's not fair, right? They didn't get paid. So it may not be fair to that association volunteer to ask for their free advice. And it may not be fair to the association to not hold that person accountable if they give crummy advice to the association. So hire the appropriate outside expertise, pay them for their guidance, and, and that way you have somebody you can hold accountable. And the, the last point that I wanna make here uh, is that when, when the board turns to a volunteer who isn't truly qualified, who knows a little bit, maybe knows just enough to be dangerous, there are multiple problems that come from that. First of all, as a board, you're outside your fiduciary duty of care by not acquiring the correct qualified advice for that particular question. That person who's volunteering, who's unqualified, guess what? They're taking on the liability of that area of expertise. So if they give you legal advice, but they're not a lawyer, they may be held to the standard of lawyers in giving you that bad legal advice. If they aren't an engineer, they may be held to the standard of care of engineers, even though they are not an engineer, but they were giving engineering advice. So it's, it's bad for both sides. It's, it's bad because you're putting that, that well-intentioned volunteer uh, in jeopardy, but you directors are also in jeopardy because you're stepping outside of your duty of care you're not exercising that reasonable inquiry. This is a huge issue and it certainly applies in the reserve area. And uh, Robert, I think you had some, some points you wanted to add on this. Right, thanks Kelly. Um, that's where we fit in. Just a good illustration of where we fit in as a reserve state provider. We help boards who are trying to make a reasonable inquiry. We offer qualified expertise. So when you don't know as a board member or manager what to do, you can reach out for help to someone who does indeed know the answers. And I see it working in two ways. One way is very simply and clearly reaching out and getting a reserve study update. That tells you what's going on with respect to your major assets there, the physical assets at the association, uh, which ones are in what condition, which ones are coming up next, and then matching that with the financial assets. Um, how much money do you have in reserves? Is that enough? And then the bottom line that a lot of clients look for is where the contributions that are required. Again, the financial side of that equation. So we can give those kind of insights. Now, um, this is an interesting intersection of the outside expertise and the board's responsibility to act in the best interest of the association, that duty of uh, loyalty and the duty of um, care. Um, because if that, contribution doesn't fit, then the board's in a little bit of a jam. Um, they need to have a good reason. Uh, they need to have a good plan. And the question is, is that a major or a minor uh, change from what's been going on at the association? So um, what I want to do here is let me get a quick hands raised to see if you want to hear about a new tool that we've developed to help boards really try to work through this question about what's a major change and what's a minor change. And very quickly, we've got a lot of hands up. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna click hands down and tell you about this new tool. It's called Uplanet. It's something we developed to enhance the reserve study process to help boards engage. So basically they can test their numbers and document their plan. What Kelly was talking about, no guessing, um, having a documentation trail so you can show what decisions you made and why. And let me real quickly show you what I'm talking about. I'm dragging it on screen. Uh, Kelly, you're seeing successfully a different screen now? Yeah, it looks great. Cool, okay. Um, Association Reserve clients, when they log in, if they're a portfolio manager, they'll be confronted with, or they'll see a, a screen that looks like this, a list of their uh, properties. And just click on one of these, and classically the uh, manager or the board will look at the completed reserve study. And what I'm talking about is you plan it. Here, it's a literally an online tool where the board can look at their components and say that, oops, the gate operators actually failed. And we've got to replace them now. 
and they can see if that's a big change or a small change, create a effective plan. Same thing here with the wood fence. They just went ahead and have scheduled that. And you can see how well I can type. So they get their components kind of cleaned up. They can, with new information that the reserves day provider didn't have, say, well, what's the plan look like? We didn't have 200, or we're not going to have $205,000 at the end of the year. We're only going to have about $190,000 at the end of the year. And that early estimate, um, Joe, the treasurer's estimate of one and a half percent interest is a little high and the more likely we're really going to have three percent inflation let's save that and you can start to look at the plan well this is a a reasonable plan um, 7300 per quarter uh, at this association you can see what it would cost to fully fund their reserves and that would be about 8750 and to baseline fund their reserves again it's real quick it's online here 6290 so the board is now empowered to know about where their reserve contributions need to be if they want to um, go off on their own decision making let's try 7900 and uh, they can say that yeah that that plan kind of works and they can print out the table and uh, show what's going on and the 30-year summary and that could be their their minor adjustment to the wise counsel they got from their reserves to a provider so let me get the uh, powerpoint back on um, you plan it is free with every completed reserve study it's part of the association reserve scope of work uh, we make it available for a nominal fee for all outside associations and we believe it is really going to help the doesn't fit problem and uh, we understand that budgeting is going to be hard enough here in 2020. And so that uh, brings us to the end of our prepared comments here today at Association Reserves. We uh, understand that running an association is hard. And like I said earlier, it takes a clear understanding of what the main thing is and then acting. As Kelly helped us understand what the main thing is for the association operating as a fiduciary we want your association to be a peaceful and productive association and uh, we are here as guides to help um, you get towards a what we might want to say a successful or improved future so that's what we do here at um, Richardson over the Niccolo uh, you can see Kelly's website here a tremendous depth of resources uh, rodllp.com or association reserves again a lot of resources at uh, our on our website uh, you can get proposal to update your reserve study and again um, all reserve studies this year and moving forward will come with you planet and at this point in time i want to say thank you all for attending and turn the microphone over to paige who will handle our q a time paige